Hello and welcome everybody. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Virtual Science Cafe. My name is Chris. I am your host every Thursday night for our program right here on the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences YouTube channel. Again, thanks for joining us. Thanks for tuning in. We have got a great program for you. Uh, a little bit of a different show than we normally bring to you with the Science Cafe. So if you're a regular to our program, normally we have a special guest on and they give us a presentation slideshow about their work and then we dive into your questions and answers. Tonight, we're gonna change up the format a little bit and we are going to have a conversation with two very special guests about a topic that I think has been on the very top of everyone's mind for the last several months. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking a little bit, a lot about the coronavirus. So I know you've got questions and I think tonight's guests, uh, whether they have concrete answers or not, uh, are definitely well prepared to have an excellent discussion. And this is something that they've been thinking a lot about. Uh, tonight's program, we're gonna be dealing with uh, the way that science and scientists were able to sort of pivot so quickly, ramp up and greatly increase our knowledge of the novel coronavirus uh, in such a short amount of time in order to try to keep us all safe and healthy and use the tools and techniques of science to do that. Let me bring in tonight's guest. First off, I want you to meet Dr. Alex Dornberg. Now, uh, if you're a regular here at the museum, you may recognize Dr. Dornberg. Alex is the now former research curator of ichthyology from the museum. Now he works in bioinformatics and genomics at UNC Charlotte. Alex, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. How are things in Charlotte? Pretty. Well, I moved here just a little over a week ago, so uh, so far so good. Um, still a little. <laughs> so you're not out. sure yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, it's nice to be here. Um, and yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, glad you could join us. And then everybody, let me introduce you to Dr. Jeffrey Townsend. Uh, Dr. Townsend is at Yale University, works in biostatistics in the Yale School of Public Health. Jeff, welcome. Thanks for the uh, welcome, Chris. I'm super excited to just chat with you today and to chat with Alex, who I talk with on a regular basis. But this will be a fun time for us to talk about science together at the Science Cafe. Yeah, I think so. Now, uh, like, I know he's in Charlotte, but I, I can't tell where you are. <laughs> I'm in uh, I'm actually in uh, Woodbridge, Connecticut right now, right outside New Haven. New Haven is where I work at Yale University. But uh, right behind me, you might see just some odd lights and stuff. I'm actually in a car right now because I had a loss of power at my home right before the show. So I set myself up uh, in my car. I hope everyone doesn't mind the little bit of a YouTube star vibe that goes. I've never done a YouTube live show before, so it's not because <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> I can tell you that much. You know, when you first joined on the call pre-show, I kind of thought I was like, oh, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's going for that. He knows the acoustic setup of the car. He's ready to go. But um, all jokes aside, we've got a pretty serious topic on on the schedule for tonight. Um, but I think the, the best place to start, the place that we agreed on to start, would be to learn a little bit about what each of you do and how that's become relevant to this modern coronavirus science that's happening. So uh, Jeff, if you wanna get us started. Well, I'm an, actually an evolutionary biologist by training um, and uh, a population geneticist, and I've done some work in phylogenetics. Uh, but then about um, some years ago, I started um, because I had a lot of statistics background from doing that kind of work, started doing some work helping people fit statistical models of, of uh, health, uh, health uh, investigations. And some of those statistical models were mathematical models of disease spread and emergence, like we've heard about so much from the COVID uh, experience just recently. And uh, so um, more recently, I've become more and more involved in those kinds of analyses. And, uh, and bringing the sort of expertise I've got from other fields has been really fun. And I hope we'll have a chance today to talk a little bit about how bringing that expertise from other fields helps to uh, answer problems that otherwise you might not even really be able to uh, know how to address. 
So you wouldn't say that you're uh, a coronavirus expert or is that, that's not really important. What matters is that, you know, you understand like so many of the tools that the virologist maybe or epidemiologist use. Well, right now, what I'm doing mostly is a lot of this mathematical modeling, but I have to say that my background is in biology rather than statistics in terms of my education. So that helps me know a little bit more about, say, the molecular details of coronavirus or, or you know, the parts, of, parts about how it gets transmitted that are actually really helpful to understand well when doing some of this uh, mathematical modeling of disease spread and emergence. Excellent, excellent. Alex, what about you? What, what brings you here? Yes, yeah, so I'm definitely not a virologist. Uh, my background is in the biology of fishes, um, as well as evolutionary biology, just like Jeff. Um, and, you know, I, my research program really is, is funded around trying to figure out how life persists. Um, and so I spend a lot of my time just thinking about, you know, the history of life on Earth and uh, how everything that's alive today has made it this far. And that's sort of taken me, I started a very large scale speaking about marine ecosystems, thinking about the Antarctic, and more and more, I've, I've delved more and more into the molecular level of persistence and trying to figure out how immune system, how the immune system works. And in diving deeper and deeper, um, it brings you closer and closer to the pathogens uh, that threaten life. And um, that's where I'm now finding myself working with Jeff on um, figuring out the evolution of coronaviruses. Okay, so, I mean, that's really interesting how, you know, Neither of you have sort of looked at uh, this kind of specific vein of research before, right? Like said, oh yeah, we're gonna do epidemiology, but the, the tools are very similar. And maybe, I don't know, it seems like a benefit that you could bring in the sort of, sort, I guess it's sort of interdisciplinary experience and tool sets to study a novel problem. Has that been uh, your experience, Jeff? Does that does that sound right, or am I off base? Yeah, yeah. In in many different ways, I think that's actually true. I often think that um, some of the science that is most exciting is done by people who start bridging from one field to another and realize there's things to apply from one field on another, and that when they bring those things to that field, it really enriches it. Um, when you're trained right within a discipline, you tend to be trained very well to do a really good job and understand all the assumptions, et cetera, that go into a model or go into a particular research project you're going into. Um, but you don't necessarily pick up on some of the sort of outside things that you could really bring along. And so it takes both types. You know, it's really good to have, I have many collaborators on the work I do. Some of them are really embedded within the modeling field and it's great to have those people because they really know what they're doing. Um, um, but uh, but that way you can sort of bring both things to bear. And, and I think, you know, science is an incredibly co collaborative affair. Uh, Alex and I are collaborating all the time, working together all the time. And uh, and I think we've sort of, uh, you know, had a really had a really good run of what we've done, partly because the two of us uh, collaborate on such a great level and are, are complementary too. you know, we have different expertises. So. So yeah. let's dive in a little bit. Um, Tell me a little bit about how you each got, uh, you already know each other, you've been working together. How did you get involved in doing COVID and coronavirus study? Yeah. Alex, you want to take that one? Um, it was actually Jeff's fault. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Mea culpa. Yeah. <laughs> I did it to him. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, I, I think really there were a lot of people in Jeff's lab who got very excited early on to help. Um, and I think I'm in the same boat as, as evolutionary biologists, you, you think a lot about, you know, how, how pathogens evolve or anything evolves. Um, and so, you, you know, you have this tool set that can be applied. And when a problem emerges, um, you sort of look around and basically are asked, is there any way I can be useful to someone? And there are people in Jeff's lab were like, oh, we, we really want to do this. And uh, it sort of ballooned from there um, to get a lot of people involved to work on this problem. Um, which is, I think, really exciting, and you know, I think as a scientist, yeah, a thing get to do. I think it's kind of an interesting story how how the the projects that we ended up doing sort of ballooned into existence. So, you know, at first, uh, everyone was sort of interested in these questions of like, did this virus come from a pangolin or did it come from a bat? And so we started downloading, you know, sequences and looking at them, and and in some ways, like that project, really, that idea of investigating that really didn't go very far. But then once we had all that data in place, we were thinking, well, we've got all this phylogenetic data on how these viruses are 
related to each other and when they're in humans and when they're in uh in animals and then there's this like little point where they transited from the animals to the humans and so could we ask something about that and then i had an old tool in my lab which hadn't been used before that is really good at that kind of question and i've been working with alex already along the way and i was just like oh my god if i could have alex's phylogenetic expertise in addition to what we've got in my lab we could really do some really good work and so um and then actually we started writing this uh nsf a proposal actually is what happened. Uh, we started sitting down and saying, well, look, maybe we can get some funding from NSF to do this research. And if we get the funding, then we can do some more research. And that's how the sort of scientific enterprise goes. And, uh, and fortunately that worked out. We, uh, we ended up writing a grant and getting funding very quickly from the NSF. They have a project, uh, a system by which they do that, which, uh, for which I'm very thankful because when emergencies like this come up, um, it's often very hard to find the funding to, to actually employ people. I hired a research assistant from that funding who's been central to the analyses we've done, Haley Hassler. Excellent. So then Jeff, uh, tell us what your piece of this coronavirus research puzzle is. Like where does what you and Alex are working on fit into the realm of scientists who are trying to understand this problem? And maybe break down too, I'll add, you mentioned sequences and phylogenetics, uh, sort of what those mean in, in context of what you're doing. Absolutely. So um, whenever you look, um, you know, we, what, whenever you do genome sequencing or anything like that, and, and now we're capable of generally sequencing whole viral genomes. So, so when I'm talking about sequences, I'm mostly talking about the viral genomes of COVID-19, which have been extracted from humans who've been infected. They've also been extracted from wild animals just in surveys that people have done. And uh, you know, so those sequences, uh, you want to know, the thing you want to know is how are they related to each other? Like are all the human ones uh, related to a bat virus that we found or the pangolin virus is the closer, closest relative. And then also like how are all the SARS-CoV-2 viruses that we're dealing with in COVID today related to the SARS-CoV-1 viruses, the ones that caused SARS, you know, 12 years ago or 14, 20 years ago, whatever it was, a long time ago. So um, the thing that is, we really want to understand how those are related. And I think later we might get to the point of like what that can tell us. But at first, the first thing I think it would be great to talk about is like our first idea. So it turns out our second idea is maybe the thing that's maybe the most exciting. But the first idea that we wrote this proposal to work on was to understand how that zoonotic event happened, right? Like we've got this terrible pandemic that's spreading throughout the entire globe, it isn't throughout the entire globe at this point. Um, and the question was like, how, how did that happen? And is there something special about the evolutionary period from when that virus is in a bat to when it becomes in a human or something like that? So, uh, so I don't know if Alex, you wanna bring it up from there, like where we started writing the proposal or, uh, or where we went from there, but. Yeah, yeah. So if we think about um, this, this, this problem is actually a really fundamental problem in evolutionary biology that, that we often, I think we have this sort of entrenched viewpoint on where we think that when, when a, a critter gets to a new environment, um, that it's going to undergo some crazy mutations to readily adapt to that environment and then become dominant in the landscape. Um, but there's also an alternate viewpoint that the, the focal organism um, is just happens to be in the right place at the right time um, and is equipped to just take over. Um, so these have been sort of two very fundamentally different views on how life really uh, comes to dominate the landscape. Um, and you can think about it, one is kind of like it's all in the timing, um, and the other is that it's really, you know, strong selection and mutation pressure. Um, and you know, there's a lot of arguing back and forth across those. And it's funny to me because it's something that, that we've worked on a lot in thinking about how Antarctic fishes came to, um, you know, evolve antifreeze and kind of take over the entire Antarctic. Um, and you know, what we found out is they were more or less, um, they were equipped um, with all the right things to, and to basically colonize the water column um, long before the Antarctic froze. Um, so the, the story of um, they rapidly adapted to take over the water column actually we found wasn't true. And in our case, looking at some of these coronavirus genomes, we're also not seeing a, a strong selection or lots and lots of mutation happening as they're switching between hosts. Um, they seem to be, pretty readily able to switch. Um, so if you think about it, it's sort of a generalist. <laughs> and, you know, generalists have a, a great 
you know, great portfolio, if you will, of, of opportunities that they can take. Um, so um, that's one thing that we're sort of starting to find looking at these genomes. It also reflects back to the kind of the conversation we've been having in the news about um, how coronavirus has jumped to people, um, you know, what's special about it. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting that that a lot of the data that we've been looking at and other people, other scientists sort of is consistent with this. It really seems like the coronavirus was kind of equipped from the get go, just as Alex said. And um, and essentially, you know, with the first person it went into, it probably infected them in a pretty serious way and was transmissible from them. And that might be a little bit of a surprise. But again, think about the evolutionary biology here. You know, we're not that distantly related to bats from bats. Right. Bats have an ACE2 receptor. We have an ACE2 receptor. Um, that's the thing that the virus actually attaches to on the cell to inject its DNA material so that it can replicate. And it's sort of the core way that it gets into us and infects us. And if we and bats have a very similarly structured ACE2 receptor, which is true, it shouldn't be all that surprising that a virus can infect us and do the same things in us as it does in a bat or in a pangolin or, you know, whatever its ancestral uh, host was. So the, the data that you're actually using in your research are these virus genomes. And That's then right. you use the modeling and the statistical methods to, to trace its lineages yeah, in, so, in relationship to all these other related viruses. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. It, you know, it turns out to be, you know, somewhat challenging to sort of trace back all of those viruses to the ancestor trace and then figure out what was before that and what was after that and what are all the changes that occur on the lineage that happened at that zoonotic event and then not only what happened but then ask the question if this change ha happened here was it did it happen because it was useful to the virus or did it happen just out of just because there are just changes that are happening all the time and it turns out that um that there are ways in evolutionary biology, so this is where the evolutionary biology side comes in for epidemiology, for instance, to actually ascertain that kind of question. And so Alex and I were able to apply those and ask that kind of question of, uh, of the coronavirus evolution during the zoonotic event. Zoonotic just means when it goes from the, uh, the other species into humans. So give us a little bit of a rundown then on the current state of coronavirus research and then how this phylogenetic work fits into that enormous puzzle. So yeah, that's an interesting question. We, so what's exciting is as we were doing this work, sort of another idea percolated um, into what we were doing. And that was um, if we already know all this phylogenetic information about SARS-CoV-2, the virus that's causing COVID on in everyone now, and we also you know, the problem is like there's only been a very short time and although scientists are all working very hard to understand about SARS-CoV-2, there's been many more years work on the original SARS, on MERS, on uh, the seasonal coronaviruses that spread throughout um, throughout every year, you know, that just give us a common cold that people have talked about. So there's a lot of information about all that, all, all that and it would be great if we could sort of figure out something about the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the one that's new here, just based on what it's related to. And in fact, what we figured out is, oh, there's some of these old techniques that we know from evolutionary biology that allow us to understand a lot of things about SARS-CoV-2 just because of who it's related to and what the ancestral relationships to all those other viruses are. Uh, and so that hopefully can uh, tell us one of the projects that we're working on right now is trying to understand whether um, what, what exactly the waning immunity uh, duration is. And so if you look at some of the news stories about what we do and what we don't know, that's one of the things that's considered the, the least understood about the coronavirus right now. We're learning more and more about its uh, molecular biology, how it attacks the ACE2 receptor. We're learning more and more about its clinical types. We're beginning to understand what treatments might work or what might not work. But really, um, you know, there's a lot of effort to make a vaccine and there's a lot of effort to understand, you know, where are we gonna be six months from now, 10 months from now, a year from now. And all of that depends quite explicitly on what happens to someone who's been infected. Can they be reinfected? Do do you know? Well, it looks, uh, you know, I, the final uh, final results aren't exactly in, but uh, it looks like it's uh, fairly, fairly longer than most of the people have been thinking. So um, which is a, hopefully a good message and hopefully we'll we'll get it down to a science. But it looks like we can estimate it quite well. 
um, and it should be just a, just a, you know, um, something on the order of um, uh, beyond a year, maybe uh, less than uh, less than three years, um, and uh, we'll have an exact answer very soon. But the point is that's going to really, really help when people try to understand future uh, projections of, of epidemic uh, disease. That's, uh, that's really incredible. I mean, even that you could get it down to, to a number like one, more than one, less than three. Uh, the, the work that must go into that, like the, comp the computations, just the brain power seems like a, a lot. And, and to make sure that you're getting it right, yeah, because you don't, you don't want to get it wrong when you're doing this work, right? Like there's uh, an incredible sort of race that's happening right now, not so much competitive, except that it's like all of science versus the impacts of this virus that's happening. Yeah, this was um, like, uh, this was really Jeff's, Jeff is brilliant. This is such an awesome idea he had. And, and one thing that, that we've done as a result of this work, so um, to explain in a little more is we can use the phylogeny, so the, the roadmap of the life or the pathway that coronaviruses have taken. Um, and we can remove SARS-CoV-2 from this analysis and just look at the ones that we have information from. So that what do we know? Um, and then we can see, can we get those right? Um, and we can get every single one of them right using this technique, which um, is, I think, just incredible that um, we did these, these replication experiments and every one of these seasonal coronaviruses, we can, we can nail it. Um, so I think that there's, there is tremendous power in, in using phylogeny and social state reconstructions to make predictions of sort of the general rules by which these pathogens operate. Um, which yeah, is cool. you, you see this in, you know, people do this for, for fossil species to figure out what they did or extinct species um, and also for things they don't have data on in organism biology. Um, and let me just connect the two things that yeah. we've told you because they're actually connected. So the first thing we told you from our research is that it doesn't seem like there's a lot of changes that are selected at the zoonotic event when the, when the virus goes into humans. And the second thing is that we can actually predict things about this virus because of who it's closely related to. And both of these have to do with the fact that the virus can't change on a dime, right? That evolution takes time. <laughs> you can't just sort of suddenly become a totally different creature from what you were before or at least doing so is very extraordinary and it takes extraordinary evidence to show an extraordinary phenomenon like that. So, so both of them are instances where basically we can take the fact that they can't do anything all of a sudden um, and we understand how quickly they change in these particular traits. And then we can actually project back and understand uh, what, what changes do happen and how much we can believe they might be selected, how much they might be different from what's expected. So both of these are, are these two things are connected and they're both connected to the fact that the organism doesn't change that quickly. You know, uh, one of our viewers on YouTube just posted a really good question uh, and related to what we we're just talking about. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw it out there for you. Um, is it possible to use viral genome phylogeny to predict mutations of the coronavirus? Great question. Uh, shall I take it, Alex, or do you have Go something to say? Yeah. yeah, so um, it, it is only possible, of course, in a statistical way. But one thing that we can do is look at which kinds of uh, sites are more variable and which ones are not more variable, right? And so one of the things that I, we didn't talk about about that first project, we said we're gonna look at that zoonotic event and what, what changes are happening there. One of the reasons we wanna do that is to try to understand whether um, there are certain sites that are highly variable and other sites that are not. And the reason why you want to understand that from those genome sequences, so what, the reason why you'd want to do exactly what that, um, what that viewer has suggested is because if you can actually see which sites are not changing in the history of the organism, then you can specifically design your vaccine to target those sites. And in principle, you might end up with a vaccine that will give you uh, a long, then a longer duration of immunity than would be expected even from a natural infection. Because a natural infection is just gonna find whatever sites it can grab onto. Whereas when you're designing a vaccine, you can hopefully grab onto some sites with the antibodies you're, you're generating that are conserved, that just don't change because they have functional constraints. They have to do what they have to do. And so if you grab onto them, it can't mutate them in a way that they don't do that anymore and it can't still survive. So, so that just means that then the vaccine 
vaccine will work really well and it'll give you long-standing immunity. So that's a fantastic question. I'm so glad they asked that. And it connects to the first uh, study that we were doing. Alex, did you have anything you wanted to bring up on that one too? Um, just, just along those lines, um, one thing that, that really struck me in doing this work is um, not only is there a great promise in what Jeff just said, but um, from profiling these, these genomes, there actually are quite a few targets, um, which um, was to me just a really joyous finding to see. It was like, wow, I, I wasn't expecting it. Um, so it was, I think it's, it's gonna be great news for people who, who do this kind of work. Um, that there are a lot of different things that can be tried. Um, yeah, I, I was surprised by that too. There are these other genes. There's everyone, well, in the scientific world, we're all talking about the spike gene, which is the, the thing that is sort of attaches to the ACE2 and causes this virus to go in. But one of the things you notice when you look at the genomes is there are some other genomes that are, other genes, sorry, in the genome that are also exposed to the outside of the cell, of the, of the virus. And maybe some of those could be targeted. It's probably harder, but, um, but I'm sure some of the vaccines that are coming out might may be doing that. They're more conserved genes in general than the S gene, the spike gene. And so when, when you have a more conserved gene, then maybe it could give you a longer immunity if you could find an antibody that could sort of get in the cracks and actually get at it. Okay, wow. That, okay, very interesting. The, the breadth of research angles, and I imagine the number of research teams that are trying to work on this and, and coming at it from different angles um, but like you mentioned, there's this, uh, you, a spike gene, you said, mm -hmm. so if, so that seems really promising. So I would imagine lots of research teams jump on that and you know, like it's been identified now more research from teams all over can focus on that. How does capital S science decide who's going to go after the spike gene Who's going to try to find the cracks in the sidewalk to infiltrate? Yeah, so one of the, the most amazing things about science is that there is no, no organized agenda at the higher level. Um, it, it's teams that are following a conversation, and um, they're going to go where they're interested and where they think they can contribute the most. Um, so at any given point, you may not even be aware that there's another team in another part of the world uh, who's working on a similar project. Um, so that being said, there also are, you know, scientists try to collaborate as much as possible and be as open as possible. Um, so, you know, in small, small communities of, of researchers, you often find out this person's working on this and you can, we also contact each other to try to form larger teams um, to address the problem more effectively. So it's sort of both of those um, happen frequently. Yeah, I think the dynamic uh, the dynamic of science is very exciting because uh, you have both a sense of competition, which you know, you know, we don't want to be negatively comp competing, but we do like to have some sense that we got to get things done. <laughs> it does speed things up, just like we know it does in the corporate world. But at the same time, you know, you're always open for that collaboration because so much of it is these complementary skills. Like, I mean, no nobody has exactly the same skill set as. Alex does or as I do so so finding those complementary relationships is just a boon to the science you do and every time you find one it behooves you to like you know establish a relationship with that person and and do some really great science so that's a it's just a really exciting uh, it's very social occupation so I, I really enjoy that about it yeah and that it's uh it seems to be such an interdisciplinary uh problem Right, like it's not just epidemiologists or public health experts who are going to solve or help us get through a global pandemic. Like it, it's it's evolutionary biologists and and a whole cadre of other researchers with all, all kinds of experience and tools and techniques uh, and equipment and labs and yeah, just experience. So that's right. There are economists who've been contributing. There's like everyone sort of, you know, everyone sort of tries to stand up and contribute what they can. And it's a really good thing. And I, I really welcome it when people from outside have some ideas they want to share and, and contribute to the conversation. So um, and, and often some of those ideas are really, really great ones. So it's a really great thing to, to have 
um, lots of interest in an area. It does mean that the, you know, the number of publications being submitted to a journal on, a, on the topic, for instance, goes way, way up. And the editors in the journals have to deal with this issue and try to figure out what's the best science that they can publish. Um, and all the people and everyone who's working on it gets solicited with tons of reviews to do, do work on this. But, but the thing is, I think scientists overall have been really stepping up to work on this, uh, this virus. I mean, it affects all of us. We're all concerned about what's going to happen as a consequence of COVID spreading in different neighborhoods in our own neighborhood and other people's neighborhoods. And so it really has uh, brought a boon of science uh, to the fore. Um, and hopefully everyone thinks carefully about, you know, what can, what specific thing can they bring to the table? Um, certainly, I feel like Alex and I have profited from the fact that we have this evolutionary biology background that's a little unique, a little different from even some other evolutionary biologists. And, uh, and that's helped us to carve out a few things that we can do that I think are distinct from what, uh, what other people might be doing. And that gives us a little bit more time <laughs> to make sure we get it right when we do our work. So in thinking about that um, and in thinking about moving, moving us into the, a future where we don't have to be so concerned about it, where, you know, where life can begin to feel normal again. And, you know, if, if that's because of a vaccine or, or however, you know, that, that future plays out, I wouldn't want to speculate, but um, using the science that's coming out and staying current, how do, how do everyday people take advantage of the most current science and research that's happening, right? Is it, uh, you know, is it about who gets tested, understanding how the virus transmits itself better? How, how, do, how does everybody collectively move forward? You know, I mean, fortunately, I think a, a lot of people have gotten an education in something they didn't expect to get an education in, <laughs> in this, uh, yeah. epidemic here. you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I think a lot of people are suddenly like, boy, uh, you know, I'm hearing all these terms that I never thought I'd think about much because they matter to them personally right now. So, um, you know, I would just say kind of embrace that, uh, you know, it, you know, learn a little bit about it and, and then you'll feel like you're in a little bit more control than if you, if you don't. So, um, but generally speaking, uh, you know, I, I'd say, you know, kind of con yeah, somehow connect with scientists who, who are working in the area one way or another. Um, and they're really great resources and they're always interested in trying to help people understand what the scenarios of, of, you know, upcoming are and what needs to be taken care of right now. You know, you asked earlier, like, what are the, some of the things that are unknown? And, and you mentioned like, you know, mm -hmm. symptomaticity and stuff. One of the things I might mention is yeah. kind of an unknown still um, and needs to be worked on even more is understanding, you know, this huge diversity in symptom level that we get with this disease. Some people are asymptomatic. They never even realize they have the disease and yet can still spread it. Other people get terrible symptoms that can kill them. Uh, and there's some correlates that everyone knows about age and um, obesity and other, you know, diabetes, other danger symbols that say, you know, this is this could be really serious if you get this disease. Um, but whatever your situation is, you never know what exactly going to happen to you if you get this disease. So, so it behooves all of us to be very, very um, cautious about it and try to figure out a way that we can, um, you know, contribute or at least understand what might cause the disease to spread and, and what we can do to, to prevent it from spreading to, to the vulnerable um, who, who might um, succumb to it. If I may, one, one other thing that I think is, is really, this is probably almost unprecedented that right now, if you're just watching the news and just kind of keeping an eye on science, um, I think it's the, the first time really that we were watching science in real time um, and seeing science as this evolving conversation with people forming hypotheses, then testing them and then possibly rejecting them, forming new hypotheses or validating hypotheses over and over. Um, so one thing that, that I think is really important to keep in mind is that science is always checking itself. Um, so when you read something might be the case or is suggested to be the case in March and then suddenly in August it's debunked or no longer supported, um, that's normal. Um, and the pace at which that's happening with, with COVID is, is incredible because so many people are working on it. So you're seeing a much faster or an accelerated timeline of the scientific process. Um, so it's something that to always keep in mind that 
you know, things that we thought 50 years ago are very different from things that we think today. And when we're working at this pace, that same thing is going to be happening. Um, so I think it's, you know, keeping up with that conversation, um, because that's what we as scientists have to do, um, is, is just part of understanding science. Excellent stuff. All right, let's see. I've had, I've had the two of you to myself for, for 35 minutes now. Uh, I'm going to flip it over to social media and to YouTube. So, hey, out there, if you're watching, you can post questions, comments. Some of you already have been in the chat boxes. And I'm going to look there and start grabbing some of those to, to toss you guys away as well. Sound good? Fortunately, right. I've, been getting them, I've been getting them in a list delivered to me directly to make it easy. Okay. How long does it take to do one uh, genome sequence? Like you get a coronavirus genome, you get, I guess what, you get a coronavirus. How long does it take to get the genome sequenced? It's a good question. Uh, downloading them, so I'm not sure uh, what the current <laughs> people are using. <laughs> Do you have a sense? Um, you know, I think, um, unfortunately, I think it varies, right? So it depends because there are different technologies for doing this. Um, you know, if I were to try to get a coronavirus sequence, like if I had a swab and I was like, I want to get a coronavirus sequence on, on this, it would probably take me quite a while to get a coronavirus genome sequence because I would have to, you know, prep the DNA, DNA in my lab and then I would send it to a sequencing center and then I would get back this enormous file of data and I'd have to figure out exactly how to process it so that I could get that genome so for me to do it individually you know all those skills are all skills that me that i or people in my lab have um, but it would take quite a while um, but science is really specialized so what actually usually happens is you end up with centers who are doing that and they have like you know a technician who knows how to do that swab isolation of the dna who passes it to another person who passes it onto a you know and it's almost like a factory where it just goes right through and gets processed and then it gets analyzed computationally and then thrown into a database right away so fortunately that kind of um you know high throughput stuff has over the past 20 or 30 years is built up to the point where it's pretty fast when you get the genome in. Now, I can't tell you exactly how fast because we don't run those centers, but it, you know, literally I'm sure that sometimes it takes, you know, you know, I, well, I, I just don't know the number of days, but it's in days, I'm sure, <laughs> to get it in. And I'm sure you could even do it faster if you wanted to like sort of super optimize the pipeline. Um, it's not really a limiting factor anymore, which is really exciting. The sequencing of viruses is, you know, they're, they have very short genomes, especially the coronaviruses or, well, I don't know, especially them, but uh, the coronaviruses are typical short genomes. They're not like crazy, crazy long virus genomes, which there are a few of. Um, and so they're pretty easy to get that sequence done quickly. Um, it reminds me of a time when, um, you know, a similar uh, epidemic happened when the Ebola epidemic happened in West Africa in 2014 to 2015. Um, the data started coming out really quickly on the Ebola genomes. And because that happened and they just released it right to the public um, when it happened and we started saw them sort of scrolling off on in our databases and and that started in my group um, an effort to try to understand sort of how much under reporting there was in the Ebola epidemic and what we basically did was take those genomes that were being sequenced off of the internet and start analyzing them and then as soon as the researcher who had produced those genomes sort of published their paper saying this paper this these are the genomes that that we made public you know over the last two three months already um, we had a paper written we submitted it and it um, it was uh, it was actually kind of an important paper because at that time there was no understanding of how much underreporting there was of Ebola and that was how much Ebola was happening that people weren't coming to the you know in in, in um, West Africa there are really organized medical systems to report every death etc but we had a way of again evolutionary biology using that evolutionary biology looking at the relationship of these different genomes to each other to try to understand, you know, did this individual, was the virus in this individual mutated too many times to believe it went straight to this other individual that we know about? And if it was mutated too many times, how many people do we estimate it passed through? And so there was a way to figure that out um, back in 2014, 2015. But the point is that 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 was not limited by our ability to sequence the genomes or by you know the, our collaborators who were sequencing the genomes. The sequencing itself was not limiting. Um, and I remember just one of their story, which is that uh, in fact, what limited that project 
later for that researcher, not us, was that they actually had trouble because they weren't allowed to see, to send the samples anymore from West Africa to the U.S. after a while. There was some legal problem that came up. Uh, and that meant that, in fact, that research was stalled for a long time. Fortunately, after that data had come out from our standpoint, because we had already gotten all the data we needed for what we were doing. But I, I feel sorry for them because it was really great that they were rolling out that data publicly from the very beginning. I really appreciate that kind of open science. And you could see at that time the number of other studies that were done by different people who have different perspectives and different tools that they can use to analyze that same viral genome data. There's so many papers that came out from that. And it really illuminated what was going on in Africa. It illuminated what was going on with that virus and, and it made the science move so much faster. Yeah, and then the same thing has been happening with COVID pretty much immediately. Um, there was an effort to consolidate all of the COVID genome data, put it in one place and just have already access to it to anyone who wants to look at it um, for the same reason. It's just everybody apply what you know and let's start tackling this problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thankful to all the scientific leaders who are taking on these projects who have made sure to make that a priority that this data goes out so other people can uh, analyze it as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, we talked earlier before the show about how um, it's the science is competitive. Yes, but there's also a sort of moral imperative to do the work right now and uh, because well, like you said, Jeff, everyone is impacted, including the scientists who are doing yeah. the work. So, uh, you know, yeah, it's so great that there's been sharing and openness and, and lots of, I would imagine, long hours and late nights to, to try to make information about this available, because that's what moves us forward. Indeed. Uh, I, I have some collaborators who have just been working so hard and I myself, of course, have been working hard. I know Alex has been working hard on the projects that we've been doing together. So um, certainly a lot of people really putting a lot of effort into this. It's very exciting. And I hope that um, I hope that um, we can sort of conquer this from a scientific perspective um, in relatively short order, because uh, we really need it to come through the science to come through now. All right, let me throw some more questions your way. If the virus mutates, are the tests that we have now valid or would they continue to be valid? Well, uh, you know, I, I, I can't say for sure what's gonna happen, but I guess what mm -hmm. I can say is the work that Alex and I have done is relatively reassuring about the fact that the mutations that seem to be happening seem to not convey these functional advantages that are really critical to the spread and emergence of the disease. And they also seem not to convey too much of the changes that, um, that would make us worried that future tests won't work or that kind of thing. In other words, they change at a fairly modest pace, these coronaviruses. Now that could be sort of set in contrast to the flu, which actually changes at a fairly rapid pace. It has a higher error rate. It makes changes in its amino acids faster. And that's why you need to have this new vaccine seen every year. And that's and in comparison to that, the SARS coronavirus changes slower. Um, it seems to have a more conserved way of changing as well. And that's that has to do with some of that duration of waning immunity uh, work we talked about earlier, um, which in which assures us that things are going to last sort of a little bit longer compared to something like a flu test or a flu um, or a flu uh, vaccine. So right now, I think the work we're doing is encouraging in that respect, at least. All right, uh, let's see. John's question here. Earlier this late spring, there was a flurry of interest in environmental conditions, temperature, humidity, et cetera, uh, most conducive to spreading or not. Is that a factor worthy of pursuing? Yeah, absolutely. I haven't published anything on this, but I spent a lot of time reviewing papers on this topic because there was that flurry of activity. Um, you no, know, I think the environmental factors are really important. In fact, um, it's been, you know, none of the studies, would I say, have been perfect. I'm a very critical reviewer, right? But, but certainly um, there have been a lot of studies and all of them show a relationship, for instance, with, uh, with particles in the air. Like, so if you have pollution particles in the air, it's clear that there's a higher case count and a higher death rate when you have a lot of pollution in the air. Um, 
how much higher is is really hard to see given the papers because a lot of good papers are showing very different slopes of how important that is. Um, and so trying to understand exactly how much is a little harder. Um, and I would just, you know, there's a lot of scientific detail to what I'd say, but I'd say the key study hasn't quite been done um, on that respect. A lot of the studies are just statistical studies showing, you know, that there's a significantly effect, significant effect, but not really characterizing in a good way what the effect is. Um, so that's still um, up in the air. Why exactly? We don't know. From the biology, a lot of it may not be that they're carrying particles of viruses so much as um, the particles actually cause inflammation in the lungs. And that inflammation can actually in the case of the kind of particle inflammation can actually limit your ability to actually defend against the virus. So those particles matter, humidity seems to matter. So um, generally speaking, higher humidity uh, is better than lower humidity. Um, that's what the papers seem to sh show so far. Um, and I don't remember if there was another one. Oh, temperature you asked about. Well, I, I think it's more more humidity that really matters, but temperature and humidity often go together in very, very cold areas or when it's cold, it tends to be lower humidity. Uh, and you have tend to have a drier uh, respiratory tract and that drier respiratory tract doesn't have as much space for the um, immune uh, system to, uh, to sort of migrate around and patrol um, right at near your epithelial of your epithelium of your lung. Okay. All right. Excellent stuff. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next one from the web. Were there significant differences between the Chinese and European COVID-19 genetic strains? Yeah, so the word significant means a lot to scientists, so uh, <laughs> that has a lot of different meanings. So I might just sort of um, first talk about that. Um, usually when we use the word significant in science, very specifically jargonly, we mean it, you know, statistically, can you see that there is a difference? And I would say from that perspective, yeah, we can see differences because when you look at, this, you know, strains that are common in one place and strains that are common in another, there tend to be specific differences. But on the other hand, this has a, been a very highly transmitted virus. So if you look at all the patterns of where it's gone and where it's going, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a mess. Like it's gone all over and there's viruses that have been transmitted once, twice, three times across to here and then back and then around to the other place. So, um, so there's definitely differences you can find geographically all over, uh, but it really doesn't uh, we haven't been able to make any definitive statement that any viruses distinguish any sort of any changes really distinguish these viruses functionally in terms of what someone might experience when they get COVID or what um, what they might do. Um, as we mentioned earlier, there is sort of the si in, in the in the world of science, there is sort of this encouragement to try to say. Um, one of the things that makes me feel very confident science actually gets at the truth is that there's always this encouragement to be the person who's saying something different. And I think the different story that has been said a couple times but hasn't yet been able to be shown is kind of the st story that a particular variant is important in some clinical way or that um, this particular variant caused the spread in some particular geography or something like that. There have been a couple studies that have sort of argued that. Uh, unfortunately, that's a really hard thing to prove. So it's really hard to know whether those studies are right or not. Um, in many cases, you just sort of have to look at it and say, well, it could be. <laughs> um, and so there's going to be a long time of people trying to understand those differences um, and, and predict whether or not they really are making a difference um, in the epidemiology of COVID-19. And I would argue that, you know, the work that we do also speaks to that a little bit. The fact that you don't seem to need to adapt from the beginning says that it was probably really well adapted when it came in, as Alex explained very well earlier. And so if it was really well adapted when it came in, then probably there's not a lot it can do to be better adapted. You know, it's been spreading really well in bats and it probably just, you know, or, or other hosts that happened before us. Um, and, uh, and it probably came in quickly. If it didn't do that, one way to think about it is if it wasn't really good, then probably it would have died out in the first human it went into. So, um, and you see that in MERS, for instance, which is a very deadly disease, more deadly than COVID. Uh, but it usually only infects one or two people before the chain dies out. Um, and it's not like those viruses acquire the, you know, they haven't been acquiring those mutations that allow it to spread. Um, and they're not likely to in the short chains of transmission that, that tend to happen. Although, you know, we have to be diligent about MERS because maybe a, another variant will come along. We never know. Yeah. And just, just to follow up, I mean, one thing um, early on, just even looking at the early sequence data that was really striking was just how, how much humans move around. 
um, and how quickly we erode any sort of geographic structuring to these clades. Um, so you have, you know, this, this clay that's comprised, well, there's an individual from Australia, then there's somebody from France, and, um, you know, it's, it's humans uh, are very good at getting around the planet very quickly. Um, the, the other thing that, that's a covariate that I think is a really exciting research frontier is actually the individual people's immune response is going to be very different. We have very different repertoires of innate immune genes between, between ourselves. Um, so Jeff has different genes in his body that I don't have. Chris, you have genes that I don't have. I have genes that you guys don't have that can mount an immune response. Um, so that's something that we really don't have a handle on is exactly what's being activated in whom and what's how is that helping to confer immunity? And that, that's, to me, one of the most fascinating things about the immune system is you have these whole families of genes that are so variable between individuals um, to confer resistance to the next unknown pathogen. I think with, with COVID, there's, there's some real opportunities to understand uh, how individual immune responses vary in the genetics behind that. Uh, this, by the way, is another thing where, uh, just another example of where coming in from somewhere else really uh, aids you in doing this. So Alex is now doing a lot of research on this topic area. That's why he's excited about it, obviously. Um, and his ex expertise in ichthyology and fish biology is one of the things that led him to sort of understand this by, by looking at fish genomes, right? That's how you sort of came across this thing. And the point is that it happens, it matters for humans too. So so these sort of things that we do in studying, you know, you know, uh, one species or another that's just related, um, end up really, really having a lot of illumin illumination uh, power to illuminate our, our own human biology. Uh, so that's just another example of coming out from, you know, from an evolutionary biologist. And if, if you were a human, uh, human, human medical biologist, you might not think to sort of come to this kind of problem in the same way uh, as Alex does using phylogenetic approaches to understand how these um, genes are related to each other and then be able to understand their differences as well as he can. So here's a question that I think, <laughs> yes, absolutely. You're both geniuses. Did I leave <laughs> oh, that, that, that in, the, in the introduction? Okay. Uh, I like this question. This is a good one uh, from John. Is there anything about coronavirus evolution that is particularly interesting? You know, before uh, it passed from human to human and became interesting to everyone. So beyond the fact that we need to know about it, uh, is there anything that strikes you about it? Hmm. I, I'd say that's a, that's a really good question. I, I haven't been thinking about that question, so I don't have a ready answer. I think one thing that I might say uh, is just that I think that it is interesting. <laughs> uh, and I kind of wish that um, that we had that we paid more attention to coronavirus biology. So the, the reason I say that is, of course, you know, like, we've all been suffering from the common cold, for instance, which there are four different circulating coronaviruses that cause the common cold. There are some other rhinoviruses. There's quite a few viruses that cause the common cold, but coronaviruses make up a substantial amount of the uh, common colds that we get. And uh, I kind of think, you know, we always sort of sp spend our time worrying about, you know, diseases that are going to kill us. And the common cold doesn't usually kill us, right? Uh, but it, it sure would have been great if we knew a little bit more about the common cold, uh, because it would have, uh, in terms of these coronaviruses that are circulating, because that would help us with making these vaccines. And I have a colleague, uh, Peter Hotez at, at Baylor University, uh, who, uh, who sort of worked on uh, SARS vaccines and was trying to get funding on to, to develop his SARS and SARS related viruses vaccine uh, for the past, you know, number of years. And then, of course, uh, this this virus came out and his his vaccine is not ready yet. And, and that's because, you know, no one wanted to fund a vaccine that treats coronaviruses. Right. Um, I think in the end, it would have been a really great idea to do that. And I think it's um. I think I think we need to think very carefully about you know, like you know where where do these uh, this just goes back to the biodiversity argument where do these viruses come from and what are their relatives and anything we can learn about their relatives now uh, say ones that are just causing mild disease in us now will really help us in the future when the next pandemic comes. Yeah. I would follow that up because I, I, to me, the thing that, that really struck me entering this world of virology is I, I had this rather naive viewpoint that we knew a lot 
Um, and I, I was really amazed by just the sheer diversity of viruses and how little we know about them. We, we tend to just focus on the ones that are really nasty to us. Um, but there are, there are millions, millions of viruses in the ocean that we know absolutely nothing about. Um, and let alone the viruses that are out there in the wild that we're going to be coming into increasing contact with as we continue to develop the planet um, and encroach on native habitats. So we, we know very little about the viruses that infect other mammals or infect um, other species of vertebrates, let alone invertebrates, and those things can jump to vertebrates. Um, so I think there, there's this, this tremendous frontier of just basic biodiversity science and understanding what we share our planet with that's... Um, you know, in a way, it's reminiscent of, you know, 150 years ago when, you know, museum curators were going out and describing the diversity in, in less explored regions of the world. I think there's there's something really, really amazing. We, Jeff and I were talking earlier about seeing a talk where somebody was collecting viruses out of uh, whales that were shooting their, their um, water up into the air with drones to see what viruses the patients have. I mean, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> So um, to me, uh, yeah. just the diversity is fascinating. And it um, changes yeah. real dogma yeah. that has been around for ages. So for instance, people have sort of classified certain viruses as, oh, this kind of virus affects, um, you know, rats or something. And then they catch it in the whale spout. And they're like, wait a second. <laughs> like, and they learn eventually that there's like much greater diversity in the whale spout than in the rat. Like, like, and how does this happen? And there's like all of this diversity that is going on. Eddie Holmes has done a lot of really good talks on this. Um, uh, he's a scientist in Australia. And, and he just has pointed out that wherever they look for viruses, they find them and they're different from, and they end up landing sort of inter interspersed in other clades of viruses that we thought were found in X, right? So what that means is, you know, when we say, you know, what was the native reservoir host for this virus? It's not clear that there always is a native re reservoir host in the sense of a host that it's just always in. Um, these kind of zoonoses happen in, among wildlife, just like they happen from wildlife to humans, they happen from wildlife to wildlife. So really we need to just think about, um, about what, how they evolve in a, in a very general way and not necessarily tie them too tightly to their hosts unless we have other information that argues they really are host specific. Yeah, and, and from, you know, just being about evolution biology, specificity tends to often be a dead end. Um, if you become too specific and the host that you're on starts to decline in population size and ultimately you know, all species eventually go extinct, um, you're, you're going to, basically, it's going to be very difficult to persist through time as a viral lineage. Um, so there probably are, are quite a few generalists out there that are able to, you know, keep um, seeding other parts of the tree of life. Uh, it's, you, you know, what's happening now seem, is, is scary, anxiety inducing, I think for, for a lot of folks out there, if not everybody. Um, but to sort of see it through the eyes of, of a scientist or a taxonomist uh, or an evolutionary biologist, uh, just the, the incredible uh, diversity, breadth, depth, like how far these things go is fascinating. Like if it weren't trying to take us all out or at least knock us down for a few days, Right then, then right you we could have some time to maybe just explore the incredible diversity, and I assume we will. Right as we, it, it's all one and the same, I guess is what I'm saying. Right, being fascinated by the the structure, the way that it spreads, um, or the incredible diversity of just microbes mm -hmm. out there, pathogens that that are doing their work in nature. And at the same time, using all of that information that we get in just trying to understand it, that contributes to how we combat it. Absolutely. And, and some of the combat is actually trying to eliminate that diversity. So 
by the way, just I think it was just yesterday, the uh, polio virus was eliminated from a certain region in Africa. Um, and so now we're restricted to just like places like a few places. I think Pakistan still has a little bit of polio virus. But, you know, this is sort of the reverse problem that we're trying to do in epidemiology is actually eliminate like we've eliminated smallpox and like we eliminated rinderpest, uh, eliminate diseases that um, that are that are plagues on humanity or on our um, you know, rinderpest is a disease of cattle that, that was that was terrible for 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 people for many years. And um, and uh, so eliminating those is a, is a great goal, but understanding how to eliminate those also in co uh, takes in, you need to take into account how you, how you can understand the diversity around those lineages as well. All right, well, um, can I keep you both for five more minutes and we'll try to just like rapid fire through some of these, the remaining questions. I okay. think some of them you can get really quick, uh, but I don't want anybody watching to feel no. unseen and unheard at right. the Science Cafe. Okay, uh, so I'm scrolling. If I missed your question, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see, Glenn had a question, where to go? In the last week, it has been reported that an individual has been reinfected after about five months of the original infection. How does that square with what you're thinking in this one to three year range? Um, so that's a great question. Uh, I, I, I don't know about the data of that particular individual. Um, there are two mm -hmm. things that are kind of important to understand. Um, uh, one is that, um, in that, uh, that as Alex said earlier, there's a lot of diversity in our immune systems from one person to another. Uh, and so depending upon our immune systems, you know, individuals may experience a shorter or longer duration of immunity. So what we really want to understand is what is the average duration of immunity. Um, and that's, that's at least what our research would, would tell us about not you know, necessarily how long everyone would have immunity if they were uh, infected. Um, and then the other thing I said, there are two things I wanted to sort of say about this. The other thing that I want to say is, um, and this is a caveat on the research that we've done, that um, in the case of this, of this coronavirus, there is this enormous diversity, as I said, in the amount that we actually experience the symptoms. And until we really understand why that diversity is there, it may play into this. Like, you know, usually unless you get a, a, a case that your immune system really mounts a response to, you may not get as much uh, waning, much uh, immunity from it. So, and I don't know about that particular case and how much they, symptoms they experienced um, the first time around, but, but the diversity of of it does give us a little bit of pause. Uh, I think that people who experience the full disease, full disease, whatever that, that means, I don't really have a definition for that, but probably uh, have a waning immunity that's about typical from the kind of analysis that we're doing. But it, it may be that asymptomatic people don't have as much because they don't mount as much an immune response because they don't necessarily need to. I don't know. This is a territory where we really need to understand more. As I've mentioned before, it's very hard to do these studies on the asymptomatic individuals because you don't see them, you can't find them, you can't pull them into your study to do the analyses. You have to sort of luck out yeah. in some way, you know, get yeah. a test on them. And usually they're fairly late in their disease and then it's harder to understand the disease dynamics. So, so the data sets are always a little bit sparse for the asymptomatic people. And that's been a challenge for scientists uh, who are trying to understand this disease. Yeah, and, and I will say for, for even the corona, the seasonal coronaviruses we have a handle on, there is a fair bit of variance among individuals um, where you have, um, you have some average, but then there are a few individuals who can get reinfected far sooner. And then a few have immunity that seems to just last like twice as long as what you would expect. Um, so there is, there is going to be variance um, between individuals. And this is where, again, the sample size also comes into play as we, as we you know, hear about more reinfections as time goes on, we'll start to get a sense of what that, that kind of distribution looks like. Um, but then we, again, with varied immune response among individuals, it's gonna get complicated. Um, but I think we are pretty okay with our, our estimate for what the average person should expect globally uh, with what we're doing. Excellent stuff. Uh, this question came in several times, should throw it out there. How long do you think until a vaccine is released? <laughs> this is the, the big question. I, okay, I, Alex, yeah, you and I million, are going to answer this really quickly. Uh, so uh, I'm going to say uh, 
I, I like to say like the earliest I can really imagine a vaccine be released as in accessible in a way that is not like a clinical trial or not to really, really privileged populations would be the beginning mm -hmm. of 2021. And that's really kind of optimistic. Um, but I, but the, the, uh, the, um, the thing that I don't think is optimistic to say is unlike many other times, we have so many efforts ongoing to produce vaccines by many, there's over 120 different efforts to generate a vaccine. I think we can feel very confident there will be vaccines for this disease. And all of the evidence so far as the vaccines have gone through trials is that there don't seem to be complicated problems. Um, we never know, <laughs> you know, phase three could be a problem for a lot of these vaccines, but 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 so far, it ha the, the, the good part of this, and there have been a lot of bad parts of the coronavirus epidemic, but the good part is the vaccine trials seem to generally be going well. Um, and so I think that we can feel confident that in a few years, we're going to have some vaccines and who knows how much, resi how much immunity they'll convey. Uh, but there will be probably more than one option, which means at least one of them will probably do a pretty good job. Yeah, and I think that's that's part of the what Jeff just alluded to was to make sure that there are no problems, right? Is the is the critical thing. That's why these trials are so important and shouldn't be rushed. Um, is we we do mm -hmm. we I'm I'm not part of this group, but the people who develop vaccines and the people who then take vaccines want to make sure that it will be safe. Um, so that is going to take time. Um, so it can't be rushed, um, and that that is part of this process is doing these trials. Yeah, we don't want the first of 127 vaccines to make it impossible to use the other 126, <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's really, really important that we be very careful with the first one that comes out, because otherwise we may be in a position where we've invested a huge amount in a potentially very successful vaccine and still won't be able to use it to defeat this epidemic. So that first one uh, and the second one <laughs> and the third one, we need to be very, very careful with and make sure it really is safe for people before we release it. All right. Uh, this will this will be the last question because we're over time, and I apologize to everybody uh, that that we didn't get to. There were so many great questions, um, but this one came in several times in different ways. So I think it, we should address it. Is how long do you think it would take for this virus to, uh, I guess, to sort of to go away, or how long do you think it would be active? One user wrote that the Black Death took seven years to go away in the 1300s. Um, Spanish flu, uh, right? The 1918 pandemic took, uh, they wrote two years. Should we anticipate that COVID-19 would disappear somehow? I think I would give two answers to that in some ways. Like there's two ways I can see it disappearing. Uh, one is probably pretty unlikely, but we've never developed a, you know, a vaccine that was widely distributed to a coronavirus before, right? So it could be that it's actually, if we can develop a really good vaccine, um, you know, in principle, and we've really vaccinated people around the globe, we might even be able to get herd, herd immunity to a level where we could eliminate it. Now, that's really sort of, you know, really optimistic sort of scenario. Like we have to get it to every corner of the globe because this thing spread to every corner of the globe. So I don't know if we could really do that in a practical sense, but I, that's one way in which it could be eliminated. Um, the other way is something that I think really deserves more research. And I know there are people working on it, but, but I, I think it's just a really fascinating area. And that is, you know, what is the limit to the number of diseases that can spread or, uh, within a population? What I mean by that is, when we look at influenza, we can see that over time, there usually aren't large numbers of different, of very, very divergent influenza strains all circulating at once. It seems like sometimes one just takes over from another and the other one disappears. So they're sort of fighting with each other for the space of infecting us. <laughs> and um, so I don't know how this COVID virus might end up, sir, for instance, fighting with the other um, uh, the other coronaviruses, the common cold coronaviruses, for the space to infect us, especially if there's some cross immunity, right? If it helps a little bit to have had a cold before and sort of depending on how much of a cold you had before uh, of a related coronavirus, that depends, uh, that tells you how, you know, how bad your disease might be. Um, so the thing is that um, we need to sort of like I think investigating that, this uh, ecological space of viruses, is just a really fascinating area that I've never done any work on. I know some people are doing it, and I encourage more research in that area, because I think that might give us clues as to how we might eliminate disease better. 
Yeah, and, and there are some studies out there showing competition with, with other viruses and seasonal coronaviruses, and that being part of the reason there's this seasonality where one year this is dominant, the next year it's not. And it, it, you know, from just the standpoint of how competition works, it, it makes sort of intuitive sense that um, we, are, we are the substrate um, and there are, um, you know, it's a competitive battleground um, for these things to, to come in. Um, so it's, yeah, I think it's, it would be a really exciting um, area of research. And, and to just be very explicit in answering the question, I think that, you know, the, the history of viruses says that it could be, you know, seven years, it could be 10, it could be 20, it could be 40. I don't, you know, it, you know, some of these coronaviruses that are seasonal coronaviruses that have been around now have been around for 40, 50 different years. So, um, and, you know, and I don't know when the zoonosis happened into humans exactly, but that's, we've certainly been studying them for that long and know they've been around that long. And so, um, you know, so it could be around for a very long time. One sort of bright piece of hope is that it could be that the second time we get this, it's nowhere near as bad as the first time. I don't know what that one reinfection case has said, um, but but we really need to see almost like the third time someone gets it to really understand that because you might have gotten a light case the first time and may get serious the second time. That doesn't mean that there won't eventually be sort of a level of immunity that we develop to this virus in the long term. But again, that's something that we're going to understand more as time goes on. Uh, but maybe we can use some of our evolutionary pro approaches, Alex, to try to figure that out too. <laughs> <laughs> Great, last one comes from me. Um, we're all seeing the news. Um, you're seeing the news and the published research on this and the, the academic and research conversations that are happening around it. Are you optimistic? Well, you heard me say I'm optimistic about the vaccine. Um, and I'm also optimistic that if we can get testing operating at a large scale, and that's not an easy thing, but if we can get testing operating at a very large scale and contact tracing operating at a scale without too much transmission, then there's something we can do without a vaccine, which is to sort of tamp it down and hold it back. So I think both of those are true. Uh, I'm most optimistic about the vaccine uh, because it doesn't require as much um, as much sort of governance and operation of the government to get things done um, to to do it because we just thought, you know, I just don't have as much faith that the government's being able to operate to t take on this disease very well uh, in recent times. Um, but uh, hopefully we will be seeing uh, some successes in this area. You know, my own state is in Connecticut, and here in Connecticut. Um, it has been tamped down for quite some time, uh, and I'm really happy about that. It's enabled us to do things in Connecticut that other states haven't been able to do. But unfortunately, anything you do to allow transmission also then increases your risk. So we'll see how it goes over the next couple of months. Yeah, it is something you do see is the, you know, as soon as people let their guard down, um, there's always that, that opportunity for resurgence. Um, but I, I'm with Jeff. I think there's so much tremendous brain power being devoted to this by so many gifted, really, really amazing people around the planet that um, I'm really optimistic about a vaccine and about just how we can understand this disease more to help combat it. So I, I, I am, I think for the next year, very optimistic. Um, I'm, I'm trying to point at brilliant people doing great work. I think Who's I, under I, think your I desk, got it. Chris? There's, there's someone under your desk, really brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, let's meet them. <laughs> I should, I should, yeah. Well, uh, okay. I've, I've let this go on long enough uh, because this has been a fascinating conversation. And uh, I hope that everybody watching has gotten something good out of it. I think so. The, the chat is still going off over here with questions and comments. So, Thanks so much to all of our engaged viewers for tuning into the program tonight. Uh, we're here with the Science Cafe every Thursday. Alex, Jeff, thank you so much, uh, not only for doing this work, but for being a part of the Science Cafe tonight. Well, Chris, it was wonderful to talk with you. And actually, I, I got to say, the questions coming from your viewers are just super questions. I'm so excited to hear them and uh, so glad that all of you are engaging in this question and trying to figure out what's going on in, the, in this time. Yeah, likewise. Thank you guys so much for, for watching and, and engaging with us and having this conversation. It's, it's been wonderful. All right. Well, 
everybody, we'll wrap it up there. I'll remind you, uh, you can subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel and click the bell next to that to get notified. Why would you want to do that? Because if you enjoyed this program, you'll probably enjoy next Thursday night's program as well. And you can get that notification so that you can come back here and join us. If you want to know more about what's coming out of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, uh, research, activities you can do at home, more live virtual events, you can follow the museum on social media, of course. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all three as at Natural Sciences. So I hope that we'll see you again back here real soon at a museum program, whether it's on YouTube, on Zoom, in our Natural Sciences classroom, or if we just see you liking and responding on Twitter. Uh, we hope to see you again real soon. You can also check out naturalsciences.org. There you can see full event descriptions for all of the programs that we have coming up. Next Thursday night, we're going to be talking about the sensory world of the squid. That's right. We're going to have a squid biologist from Lenore Ryan University. Dr. Carly York is going to be on the program. So we're going to have a cool chat about some cool critters, squid, next Thursday night. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Stay safe. Don't forget your three W's, okay? Wait six feet apart, wash your hands, and wear a cloth face covering. The North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services wants you to know to remember your three W's. Good night, everybody. <laughs>